Hear now the word of the Lord from his servant, St. Matthew, chapter 14, verses 25 through 31. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Jeffrey. I want to take just a moment to bring you up to date on something. We had our uh, our partnership drive uh, it, it back in uh, it back in October, November, and um, wanted to give you an update on that. We have uh, tw uh, ninety partners in for our min our ministry giving for 2020. Of those 90, 29 were new. That's to be celebrated. And of that 90, also 27 increased their giving from 2019 to 2020. That represents approximately a $10,000 increase over our, our projected giving of those who, who pledge uh, for 2020. So I wanted to bring you up to date on that and commend you on that. I think you deserve a round of applause. Thank you for your generosity all throughout the year. And thank you for your pledge. Uh, and, and also, thank you to those who give regularly and generously but do not pledge. And, we, and again, we appreciate your generosity. Let us pray. Father, if we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the greatness of your glory. We thank you, Father, for your, you sharing your glory with us in your Son, Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for the faith that was once handed down unto the saints that is now given unto us and that, Lord, we are stewards of, that we seek to pass on to those who do not know you today in our generation. Father, we, we ask that you would grant us boldness to move out beyond the places that are safe and secure and familiar, Lord, that we would indeed um, proverbially walk on the water. We ask this in the name of Christ, our Lord. Jeff Foxworthy is probably one of the most familiar names in comedy today. Probably one of the, the, the um, of of the best comedians today, but he's also one of the cleanest comedians in the uh, in, on the circuit today as well. He has literally made millions of dollars parroting the Southern culture in five words: "You might be a redneck." This is one of my favorite ones. He said, if, uh, if you stare at an orange juice carton because it has the word concentrate on it, <laughs> you might be a redneck. <laughs> Concentration, that's hard. Keeping our focus, that's difficult. We live in a world where we have cell phones that are millions times more powerful than the first computers that helped land the, the Apollo spaceships on the moon. We have at our fingertips a world of information. We live in such a digital technology, a, 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 digital, a digitally driven technology, technology driven world that's a tongue. That's a tongue twister for someone who can't talk anyway. <laughs> but you got the gist of it. <laughs> we live in a, in a high-tech world. I should have said that to begin with, right? <laughs> we live in a high-tech world. But it's filled with distractions. You go to work, you open up your email, you start replying to work emails, and then you see something pop up on your computer screen that you have a, a Facebook notification. So you click on it, find out somebody has tagged you in some post that they have made. Then you, you leave Facebook, but as you're leaving Facebook, there's an article. 
And so you quickly read that article. That reminds you that you were supposed to order something for your wife off of Amazon. So you go to Amazon and do all those things. Distractions are incredible today. Uh, I was watching this morning I was, as I was eating breakfast, I was watching SEC Now. That's the summary of the SEC games from yesterday. And, and there on the bottom of this, okay, there's three guys sitting there doing commentary on the ball games yesterday. And then there are the, the, the ribbons down at the bottom. Six different messages on the bottom of the screen, in addition to three men talking and giving commentary. Is there any wonder that we can't concentrate and focus? Jesus came to the disciples walking on the water after he had fed the 5,000, had gone up into the mountain to pray. He sees the disciples on the lake struggling against the oars because of the wind was against them. And he goes out to them walking on the water and they're startled because they think Jesus is actually a ghost. Crying out in fear, Jesus responds, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. At which point Peter, in his typical fashion, calls out and says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you walking on the water. Then there's the shocking response of Jesus in one word, come. So Peter gets out of the boat and begins walking toward Jesus. And we read this morning, seeing the wind, he began to sink. Now to give me a little, a little, uh, a little insertion here. Some, I, I, I had someone say to me this week uh, that their spouse said, hasn't he preached on that, top, on that passage before already? Well, if, you, if you've been following along, we're kind of adding almost a sentence every now and then. So even though it's the same text, it's a different message. So uh, I just want to re re reassure you of, of that. But here's, but here's what Jesus did. Peter is thinking, he cries out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reaches out his hands and lifts Peter up. And then he says these words, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You of little faith, why did you doubt? A couple of observations about this, this one little sentence. Number one is uh, Jesus didn't excuse Peter's failure. Now, we're calling it a failure because there's really not another word we can call it. It's not like he, he failed miserably. It's just that because of his, his, his little faith and his doubt, he began to sink. So we're just going to call it a failure. Even though a failure is simply an understanding of what not to do next time, right? Jesus didn't excuse him sinking. He didn't give him a pass on it. He called him on it. You of little faith, why did you doubt? The other thing of note, and I think Ortberg points this out in his book, uh, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat, he does, uh, uh, he gives this reproof in private. Peter had gotten out of the boat, had walked to Jesus, was walking toward him, and then he began to sink. He cries out. So he is some distance from the boat. And so Jesus' words to Peter are in private. He didn't wait till he got back in the boat with the other disciples and then do that reproof in public. He did that in private. Maybe even as he's reaching out his, reach out his hands. You of little faith, why did you doubt? The other thing that I think is interesting that I did not, I had not realized maybe until I was preparing this message was Peter actually walked on the water twice. He walked from the boat to the place where he began to sink, but then Jesus lifted him up and they had to walk back to the boat. So Peter actually was raised up and walked on the water twice. What do we evaluate? We evaluate things that are important to us. This morning I was getting in my truck there in the garage and walked past my back tire and saw a little bit of wear on the outside of my back tire. It's got 50 some odd thousand miles on it, so it's getting close to new tires. 
And I stopped and evaluated it. Why? Because it's valuable to my safety and the safety of my family. We evaluate, hopefully you, you evaluate your retirement portfolio from time to time, seeing if the equities are where they need to be and the bonds and all those things that I have no idea of, no understanding of it. Maybe you don't either, but we hope and pray that somewhere down the line it will be there when we retire. So we, so we evaluate the things that are of value to us. Know that Jesus evaluated Peter's faith journey. You have little faith. Little there can mean small in quantity or quality of faith. It might, it might simply mean that, that Jesus was saying to Peter, you've not had op ample opportunity to grow and mature in your faith. But also doubt. Doubt and faith are two, two, uh, two peas in the same pod sometimes. They are, they are two things that hold in tension with one another. If we're people of faith, we're going to wrestle with doubt. The question is, will I allow my doubt to overcome my faith and cause me to be paralyzed and to not move forward in my faith, to not follow in obedience, to not do the things God has called me to do, you and I to do, or will I allow my faith to overcome my doubt and be obedient and follow and experience joy and peace and love and grace? So which will it be? Because they're both going to be present all throughout our lives, faith and doubt. But which one will we allow to rule our lives? If, if Christ came into the world, if God came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ, born of a virgin who died on the cross and who rose on the third day and then ascended into heaven and then sent to us the Holy Spirit to be with us, to be His presence with us all throughout our lives, then is not our faith not worth evaluating? If it's in true, if our faith is truly of value to us, will we not evaluate our faith? If we expect to move from the place of safety, of, of security, of comfort, of familiarity, we can expect God, through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to begin to evaluate us, and we to evaluate ourselves. Why do I doubt? What causes doubt? What causes doubt to lead to little faith? That's what we want to talk about this morning. There, I have three points. Uh, we have sermon notes out in the lobby. Hope you got those before the worship service. Three, three things that I want us to touch on, real, on really quickly. Number one is that the reason why we have little faith in our, and we doubt is because we don't expect to wobble when we walk. Not waddle, but wobble. <laughs> to wobble. Walking on water had to be really quite unfamiliar. It had to be a weird feeling, uh, visually as well as physically. To, to step on water, expect, fully expecting it to give way, and then suddenly it is, it is sustainable to one's weight has got to be confusing mentally. So to expect Peter to walk comfortably, boldly on water is a little bit of an over-expectation, I would think. We're told what faith is. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for and the assurance of things unseen. Think about that for a minute. That's how we're supposed to walk in the world as followers of Christ. We're to walk in faith of the things that we believe Christ is doing and has done for us and is applying into our lives. We hope for that. We hope in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We hope in, the eternal, in, in eternal life. We hope in the grace and the mercy of God toward, toward us. But we don't physically see those things. That's what the next part of that verse is. And the assurance of things unseen. So we're asked, to, to walk in faith 
believing things that we have not yet received, not yet realized, while believing that they are fully there and present, even though we can't see them. Walking in faith is hard sometimes. It's difficult. Because we have the world telling us one thing, and we have the draw and the, and the attention of the world. We have pride, we have greed, we have consumerism, we have the pleasures of this life, the flesh, lust. All those things are bombarding us, and we're seeking to walk by faith, and we expect to do that and not wobble. Isn't that a little much to expect? But here's the other side of that. We can, we can realize that we will struggle in this, in this faith journey to uh, implement and apply the principles and the promises of God in our lives and to walk in faith and boldness and confidence. Or either we will just succumb to the idea that I'm just meant to sink and then to be raised back up just to sink again. And so we're on this roller coaster of an experience of faith that is frustrating and aggravating and disappointing and not fulfilling at all. Learning to walk in faith is difficult. We have to go ahead and admit that. It's like walking on water. There will be places that we stumble and we sink, but we cry out, Jesus rescues us. We need to evaluate a little bit. Why did I stumble? Why did I fall there? Scott Kelly, the astronaut who spent 340-something days on the um, International Space uh, Center, uh, when he landed, the, the, uh, uh, an article that I read said that, that his ability to walk was greatly impaired. He could hardly stand up. He went from basically zero gravity to the full forces of gravity on this Earth for almost a year, even 20, almost 24 hours later, it said, the, the article said that he was stable when he walked, but he still wobbled. How old is Scott Kelly? I don't know, 30s, 40s, I, I suppose. Spent one year in the space station and then he had to learn basically to walk all over again. We've been walking by, by our flesh and by the natural life and by the things that we can see for so long that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, it's suddenly trying to walk on the moon for us. It's difficult. It's not natural. Second thing, the, the second reason why uh, faith, we can have little faith and doubt is because we, we begin to think that sinking is a failure of our faith when it's not. Sinking is a failure of focus, not faith. I don't think Peter's faith failed. I think his focus failed. Fo I, the focus of our faith is more important than our faith itself. I want you to hear that again. The focus of our faith is more important than you and I saying that we have faith. Because I think so often we can, we can say we have faith, but we have faith in, in, we have faith, the hope that we will be healed. We have, we have faith maybe in fate that, well, everything was just going to work out. So is that really faith in Jesus Christ? I don't think it is. Sometimes I think we can have more, pop, more, more confidence in the, in the act of faith than we do the object of our faith. And what is the object of our faith? Who is the object of, the, of our faith? It's Jesus Christ. Paul wrote, unto him who is able to keep you from falling. Who is him? It's Christ. He goes on to say, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I think what happened with Peter was, it was not that his faith failed, it was the fact that he saw the wind and the waves and he became afraid and began to doubt. 
the things, the circumstances around him took precedent over the one that he was walking toward. And that was Christ. Thirdly, doubt occurs when we focus on competencies and not calling. We begin to doubt. Our faith can be, can be weakened when we focus on our competencies, not the calling. Peter wasn't supposed to be walking on water. It is, it's, in, it's an impossibility. You just don't do that. But yet, he said, Lord, if it's you, commend me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, come on. Gets out of the boat and starts walking toward Jesus. So he sees the wind and he, the waves and it's crashing against him, against him. And I wonder if he began to question his competencies. And maybe saying, I'm not even supposed to be out of the boat. I'm not supposed to be walking on water. I can't do that. So he began to focus more on his competencies, his abilities, than the one who had called him to come to him. Our competencies look very different for each of us. Competencies in the faith and in our service to Christ might, might mean our, our exquisite training at a renowned seminary, or it might be our training in the armed forces, in the military. All that is good. It's rich. It's powerful. It's necessary. It's, it's all part of, of the puzzle of how God puts the body of Christ together. But when we focus either individually or corporately on competencies and not Christ and His calling to us, we're bound to sink. We're bound to begin to question and to doubt. And then that leads to people of little faith. Billy Graham, it was, it's told that when Billy Graham was wrestling with a calling into uh, the ministry, that he went to his pastor. And uh, thankfully, the pastor is not named because he would never work again. <laughs> and the pastor told Billy Graham, he said, you need to go back to the farm. God hadn't called you to preach. <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm glad I wasn't that preach pastor. <laughs> I kind of blew it on that one, didn't we? The pastor was looking at competencies, maybe. Billy Graham was looking at calling. Everything in the natural told that pastor that Billy told him that Billy Graham was not the person for the ministry. But look what he did. He focused not on competencies, but on the calling. God, is, uh, this is an old saying, but it bears re re repeating. God does not call the competent. He equips the called. He doesn't call the competent. He equips the called. He didn't call us to walk on water. But when he calls us to walk on water, we don't have the ability to walk on water, but when he calls us to walk on water, we're enabled to walk on water. We might see our competencies as, well, I don't have enough education. Or it might be the fact that, well, this is in my background. You don't know the things I've done. I'm divorced. I'm whatever. We look at competencies instead of the calling. We look at our failures and say, I'm not worthy. We're looking at competencies and not calling. So how do we put out into the deep? And I'm changing that up during this series a little bit. Do you want to walk on water? Here's, here's a couple of questions that I think bear asking of ourselves, and it's this. Is your vision or is our vision too small? There's, there are some uh, uh, theologians out there who say that Peter walking on the water was just showboating. 
it really accomplished nothing. It was Peter, in essence, showing off. Maybe he was in typical Peter fashion. But you know what? We would have never known the power of God to enable him if he hadn't simply said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come. I wonder if we have just a way too small of a vision of what God wants to do in your life, in my life, and what God wants to do in and through us as a congregation. Do we want to cry out to God Lord, if it's you, command me or command us to, and you fill in the blank. We live in a small boat, and Christ is calling us to get out of the boat. The other question that goes along with that is do we focus on our limits? our capacities, our competencies, rather than the calling. I would suspect to say that the answer is yes. I know I do. And I don't want to do that all the time. And I hope that's your desire too. Lord, help us to live beyond our capacities and our competencies and our own human limitations. Do we want to walk on water? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.